there's always a lot of issues to look at, especially when you are building up to what some officials of INEC call the mother of all elections. The first of it in a long time, they, they, some of them say. But, you know, what are, which has some of the issues? Which of these issues would you consider the most crucial, most important, beside the PVCs and even the electoral process itself? Where are we lacking? What must we do to make sure that this election has the integrity Nigerians desire that there will be no rancor at the end of the day. To so have a look at this and several other issues this morning, we have Dr. Tunji Abayomi, who is a human rights activist, as well as Post Chancellor and Chairman Governing Council at Dekunle Adjassin University. He joins us here in the studio. Thank you so much for joining Thank us you today. Thank you for inviting me. Well, INEC is preparing, Nigerians are preparing, political parties are preparing, mm -hmm. civil society organizations are preparing, mm -hmm. election observers are preparing. Who's and the world is watching. And the world is watching. <laughs> yes. um, you know, but of all the issues that are coming up, one that's becoming a little more concerning for INEC, beside the issue of insecurity, is that of fake news. In fact, I, 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 I read a report. We'll, we'll get to that report. But how significant is this for you? Because one of the reports that INEC put out, for instance, said that they saw a report, a, a news, a press release that says, this is from INEC, and they looked at it. It was the signature of uh, the INEC official that normally signs and all these things, but at the end of the day, it says, this is my signature, but it was not me. I didn't put this out. Mm -hmm. So how do we combat fake news at such an, in the process of such an election as important as this in Nigeria? Well, I think the dialogue, the type of dialogue with engaging in here would help in the process. But the truth of the matter is that uh, the tremendous access to uh, social media, and um, I will call it the revolutionary transformation of communication. Uh, without um, you're talking of um, access without borders, so to say may make it largely impossible because sometimes you see news either on um, Facebook, internet, originating from sources unknown and accredited to individuals. So the uncontrolled access to uh, social, media, social platform will make it impossible. And it's a difficult situation because at, the, uh, at one end, you're worried about fake news. But at the other end, you also have to be concerned about freedom of speech, which is obviously is essential for democracy. So it's a sort of a balance. Uh, really don't know. There's no uh, magic, you know, uh, you know to control it, as far as I can see. Who will sermonize for who now? That's probably one of the questions that, to be, that should be asked, because, of course, you know very well that the federal government has been doing what it can to at least educate people, sensitize people about the fact that we need to control what we uh, put out in yes. the name of information. Mm -hmm. And, of course, because of that, people put out all kinds of things. But then there is also this dilemma of freedom of um, speech mm -hmm. not being hindered by clamping down and all of that. Mm -hmm. But then the laws are not silent on slander, on libel, and all of those things. You said it's a balance. Mm -hmm. The laws are clear. Mm -hmm. But then sometimes enforcing those laws can be such a, a challenge as, as well because on the one hand is freedom of speech. On the other hand is fake information being put out. Who will champion any of the laws against slander or libel in such a case? It's a difficult issue because slander, libel, and so on and so forth are uh, remedies against individual uh, threat to reputation. You can't really exercise such rights against public institutions. I think the presumption of law and the liberty that is granted to freedom of speech is that at the end of it, it will regulate itself in the marketplace of ideas. 
that at a point, good ideas, good thoughts, valuable and correct information will knock off uh, wrong information in the marketplace. That's the whole idea of public space. But the you know? damage, some damage could have been done before that. Well, the presumption is that there will be no damage because if you come out and you say, for example, Tunji Abayo means Dada Ajayi, something will turn around, somebody will come up, maybe he himself will rise up and say, no, I'm not Dada Ajayi, I'm Tunji Abayo. And so eventually people, the balance will be such that the pendulum will tilt in favor of truth instead of falsehood. Because the, 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 the difficulty of regulating freedoms, freedom of speech is the consequence would be to deny it if we were to, de if we were to regulate and control negative speech. The effect may be to deny a right that is essential, mm -hmm. not only to human relationship, but also to the issues that concern governance. So that's, that's the delicacy you know, that, that, is, that is involved. And I think it's an interesting yes. angle you yes. bring to this. Because for some, prevention is better than, than trying to cure it or yes. trying to manage it when it has happened. So what, yes. that's why a lot of people think people that should know better perhaps should be the ones to champion this and not be the ones caught in that. Yes. And, and I'm talking about politicians now. Yes. And it brings me to this point, because over the past couple of days, now it looks like the closer we get to elections, the more intriguing things get. Mm -hmm. We've seen the parties you know, some of them engaging in the brickbats. I mean, it's something you usually expect. It's a political season. But mm -hmm. when we have clamored for issue-based campaigns, mm -hmm. there's been a first phase of the peace accord signed, and all the candidates said that, you know, we're going to abide by this peace accord. You'd at least expect that things would be different and issues would be focused upon. But then what we have seen is quite different. And as a politician, if I can call you that as well. I'd like you to speak to this. And I'll talk about the one, because let's, I want us to be specific mm -hmm. so we can deal with them. Mm -hmm. The one between the APC and the PDP. Mm -hmm. The APC has had its fair share calling on, uh, you know, the prosecution of the PDP's candidate. Mm -hmm. The PDP just recently said, well, it's the APC's candidate that should actually be arrested and prosecuted, and they gave reasons. But before we get into them, I want us to step back, and I'd like you to maybe speak to this. Do you think we're getting anywhere? with all of this? Should Nigerians take it serious or just relegate it to the usual brickbats, politicking? Are these issues? I don't consider them to be issues. If we watch the debate, even for example, among presidents, I was just watching a debate between uh, Barack Obama and the uh, conservative um, Republican candidate. The Republican candidate was making assertions that are clearly false. And Obama came and said, but everything he said is untrue, is false, and so on and so forth. It's almost impossible to avoid this type of confrontation, rightly or wrongly. But all of that will soon be resolved. I think Nigerian people should simply disregard that and focus on, on the serious issue of voting for the next government, because this nation really needs um, I would say the faithful choice of the people to raise it up. Mm -hmm. And I think the most essential, and we are talking of the mother of all the election, because in my view, the most fundamental choice for this nation is that this nation must simply rise out of poverty. The whole thing that we are seeing in the world is sort of what I would call the tendency towards utopian aspiration, which is um, evolving among the youths, essentially confirms dissatisfaction, the prevailing, prevailing order. I mean, you can see it follows generation of um, struggle among peoples of the world. Whether you are talking of uh, 1789 uh, French Revolution, or you are talking of uh, 1917 Russian Revolution, or you are talking of 2010, 2011 Arab Spring, or you go even up to 2019 um, uh, Ecuador, and so on and so forth. There is a very deep dissatisfaction with the prevailing order. And um, what do we need? 
in place of this dissatisfaction. I think that should be what should preoccupy mm. our people. But you know, sir, this, the issues raised, they also have to do with the integrity of the candidates. Yes, we cannot get the perfect state, but I think the goal is to at least strive towards something near perfect, or at least something that is devoid of all of the things we've experienced in the past. Yes. So when you hear uh, SPV for corruption allegations from the APC to the PDP, and the PDP says, well, your candidate is, has been involved in drugs, cornering uh, states' funds, and all of that. Right. These are issues that, yes, you might say that maybe the, the, the electorate should put it aside and focus on the issues. Mm -hmm. Well, the lecturer will think, so this person I thought I wanted to vote for, or at least I chose to mm -hmm. vote for, what if the person turns out to be someone who will topple government because of the track records that these people have alleged, mm -hmm. the integrity issues? So mm -hmm. the question is, in the light of those integrity-based issues, or at least issues that question integrity, mm -hmm. shouldn't the electorate still think these are issues as well? Well, there are issues in order to make personal choice. But we are not in heaven. We must also appreciate that. We are in the world, and it's, it will be presumptuous because the tendency of Europe, utopian aspiration, at the end of it, it achieves very little. If you study the history of uprisings in the world, if you look at, for example, the Arab Spring, what has happened, People say, oh, okay. Yes, most of it is because of reaction to poverty, reaction to corruption, and so on and so forth. But only sinful men will bring a society, will raise the society. Because the problem of the society are the sins. And they understand the value of those sins and the effect. Please say that again. Only sinful men. Only sinful men will raise the society from sin. Because they understand what the effect of the sin, the consequences, the, the structure of sin, and how to manage them. If you are looking for a holy men, you are not going to achieve a whole lot. If you look at the history of the world, that's just the reality. So in our nation... But my, my apologies, sir. Yes. Is that to say that those integrity issues do not matter, particularly if one way or the other they do not line up with the aspirations of Section 23 of the Constitution? Well, no, integrity issue matter, but it's to a certain extent. The Constitution speaks of against corruption, against this, and so on and so forth. Yes. Obviously, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that. But to expect that personal uh, holiness of candidate, a man that has gone through the structure of life in this nation, a nation, anywhere in the world, for example, you find that politicians <laughs> are sinners. For example, you cannot run politics, you cannot run office without money. Money is the root of all evils, <laughs> quote unquote. Or somebody says the absence of it is actually the very fundamental <laughs> root of Evil. problems. You understand? Well, so, what I'm in essence saying is that there will be some form of balance. Yes, there will be a sinner, but not a murderer, if we understand what I mean. So we must understand that. Now, Dr. Pahamidi, you know, it's a, I mean, you spoke about balance the other yes. time, so let's see if it is possible. You are talking about issues yes. that are important, germane to the Nigerian. Mm. Uh, you've, you've, you mentioned poverty in particular. Yes. And a significant number of people will look at unemployment, um, homelessness, uh, deprivation, mm -hmm. uh, rural uh, development, literally stagnated and all of that as issues. Yes. But then there are some of these people who have been in the circle in, in various circles of influence over the years yes. for long enough to have been able to do one thing or the other about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Yet not, nothing significant yeah. has been achieved by yes. any of them, perhaps by way of influencing the governors mm -hmm. or influencing anyone in any office yes. to be able yes. to do some of these things. So if you are saying it's the sinner that knows the path to sin and can cut it, yeah. but then the things that, caused, that the sins have caused mm -hmm. have inflicted a lot more pain on people, mm -hmm. Why not look for someone who has a semblance mm -hmm. of what you call holiness? Mm -hmm. 
there, there will be that argument, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. So that at least, okay, we know that these ones are grievous sinners, mm -hmm. but how about this one? We, well, he's not perfect, but he's not as sinful as these ones. That's well, the utopian that you probably are talking about, that yes. the young people seem to Somebody was saying yesterday that, um, I think it was in Mexico, that they were looking for uh, the best economists, so they went to Harvard, and they took uh, some of the best minds to some of the leading uh, institutions, PhD in this in economics, with the hope that they would transform the economy. At the end of it, or they made the economy considerably worse. The truth of the matter is that, in my view, this nation needs a man, what I call with ancient wisdom, ancient wisdom, in order to help this nation, not necessarily a holy man. Now, you have to ask yourself, what really is the fundamental concern, neurosis of our nation with the greatness? This, this nation, with the fecundity, the, the the capacity and stature of a citizen should be one of the greatest nations in the world. So what's the problem? The, the principal issue for now, and each generation, each period in human history, they have their own challenges. The challenge this nation faces today, and the foundation of most of the neurosis and the crisis is poverty. So you now have to ask yourself, of the people that are running, who can create wealth for this nation? Who can rise to the challenge of poverty? Look, I think it was in one of the Russian presidents who said a nation is wealthy when it has wealthy people. But they, Dr. Bayami, on that, yes, yes. you don't think leadership is a more significant problem than poverty? Because there are those who would say, if we had the right leadership, we wouldn't have poverty. Yes. No, leadership is significant because it is leadership. It's more significant than poverty because it is leadership that will transform our poverty to wealth and change, you know, the, the stature, the tragedy that we face. But what I'm in essence saying is that our preoccupation now is not whether the man is, uh, <laughs> has one wife instead of uh, or maybe five, or that the man uh, smokes uh, mari marijuana, you know, instead of, uh, you, know, you know, going to church. Or no. So what I'm in essence saying is that we must be practical, sensible, and face the challenge of this time. The challenge of this time is not, the, it's not holiness, I'm sorry to say. What we need in this nation is a sinner who can develop us, as far as I'm concerned? Who can give us, who can create wealth for this nation? At any rate, if we look at all of us, I think the Bible says if we were to count sin, who will stand? If, if I may just ask it. So sometimes we pay too much attention to what I call metalegal factors instead of focusing on the larger issue right. that so will. Essential. Certainly, your views will be quite interesting. I mean, yes. let us know what you think, and I'm talking to our viewers. Let's yes. know what you think about this, because it's, 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 a, it's a new kind of thinking. Yes. Perhaps that's what a lot of politicians even think about, but yes. they've never really come out to say yes. it. So it's interesting that you're breaking the ice mm -hmm. here. But then the concern will be, this is not to shoot down the idea. I think it's important for ideas to contend, and we'll come up with something. But the concern will be, we, we have a constitution. Yes. We have laws that prescribe punishment. Yeah. for sins yes and never have i seen in any of those laws that the reward for sin is to elect or to get elected into office mm -hmm. the rewards or the punishment for sin mm -hmm. in that context mm -hmm. is well spelled out mm -hmm. for corruption yes. it is spelled out for this it is spelled out yes. so mm -hmm. if we now elect a sinner as yeah. you said as, yeah. and, and i think it's a very interesting conversation mm -hmm. but if we elect a sinner the challenge then is that you're sending a message to the people that man it's okay to be a sinner in fact, if, you be, if you're a sinner, yeah. you get a reward, yeah. which is to become possible leader at certain levels. So aren't yeah. you concerned that with this kind of thinking, we're breeding a situation where sin is now permissible, in spite of the laws we have, which frown against sin? Well, first of all, let's understand something. The, even within the law, sin is permissible. Interesting. For example, let me explain to you. 
how many people, first of all, the government will decide who to prosecute. There are lots of sinners. <laughs> the, the government cannot prosecute all sinners. It will now choose, okay, it's A I want to prosecute, while B, who is also a sinner, is free. So there's really no perfect system. That's the first issue. The second issue is that there is also legal process to control some of these issues. For example, a president can be impeached if the National Assembly is serious and is doing its work, if the president goes control gross misconduct. That's for the purposes of the Constitution. That's the greatest sin, gross misconduct, which is actually defined by the National Assembly. Then the president can be impeached. So all of that is already ingrained in the, in the Constitution. So, but if we now are talking of election, and then we have spent all our time looking for a holy man, where are we going to find the holy man? Well, are We're you, not going to find them. Are you by any ways or by any means dichotomizing sin from offense or breaking the law? Are you no. saying it, a, breaking a law is different from sinning? Yes. Breaking the law is different from sin. I'm talking of, when I'm talking of sin, I'm talking of personal morality, which is what we focus on so much in this election. Nobody, for example, is saying that, oh, you've broken this law in this something, and so on and so you need to be, and so on and so We focus too much on personal morality when we are talking of electability of individuals for office. In terms of breaking the law, obviously, you are disqualified by law, legal standard, not by the standard of morality of the people. So it's important for us to appreciate that. Right. So how do you then expect uh, a person with warped morals, an immoral person, to build a nation without the person engaging in corruption? Because, I mean, these things add up. An immoral person, someone who permits this, permits that, as you've said, sin is not entirely, I mean, you even said the laws permit sin in some yes. context. So how do you expect an immoral person to be a leader, someone that people look up to? In fact, they've said that when you even have someone who frowns against corruption, the system fights that person. So imagine someone who is immoral. The system that wants to be corrupt says, oh, fantastic. It's an all-for-all -all affair. So don't you worry that an immoral person will then breed multiplication of immorality and topple the government or the nation? Well, first of all, the question of the standard of morality is that's the issue for the people. And that is, the people are already given the chance to determine that standard by their elections, by their votes. You know, by their vote, they decide that, look, we don't want this person, we want this person, and so on and so on. That's number one. If peradventure you then elect him, first of all, even the issue of that is essentially judgmental. Because in large measure, what you consider immoral may be, for example, considered moral. In this nation, for example, there are churches that say, if you have two wives, you can't come to the church. For them, that is their morality. On the other hand, there are other churches that said, no, you can marry as many wives and so on and so forth. That's the first thing. So sometimes this is judgmental. This is not to say that a leader must not have values that are essential values that are vital for lead leadership, concern for the people, compassion. If we read um, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, by this um, famous um, Paulo uh, Freire, you, who, is supposed, who is considered the philosophy of change, this, this um, Brazilian um, philosopher. You know, he, is, he talks of, uh, you, know, we, uh, you know, he talks of, of activism, that we should be careful of activism that focuses on utopian uh, tendencies. You know, because we are in the real world. Mm. You, know, <laughs> you know what I mean? But change is change is not going to bring it's not going to come well, through the, morality. Uh, it will I, come I, through I practicality. That, the, uh, that that sounds a little you know uh, 
something that one should interrogate further because, as we mentioned earlier, yes. the Constitution is clear on certain things. For mm -hmm. instance, so Section 23 talks about national ethics. Mm -hmm. Section 24 talks about duties of the citizen. Perhaps we'll look at that yes. uh, in a little deeper context mm -hmm. when we return from this break. Please stay with us. <laughs> Thank you for staying with us. Dr. Tunji Abayomi is still with us here this morning. Well, Dr. Abayomi, you know, your, as my colleague said, your, your perspective this morning is very interesting. <laughs> but, you know, we're talking about what the Constitution says and, you know, talking about the laws and all, morals, ethics and all. Section 24 of the Constitution lists duties of the citizen. Mm -hmm. And the second one says that every citizen has a duty to help enhance the power, prestige, and good name of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. C says, respect the dignity of other citizens and the rights and legitimate interests of others. On and on and on like that. Let's pay a little attention to that second one. Help enhance the power, prestige, and good name of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. How does a sinner help us enhance the power, prestige, and good name of Nigeria? By reducing his sins instead of enhancing his sins. So he's a certified sinner. Yes, well... Shouldn't it go I, answer to those sins rather than reduce it? <laughs> instead of leadership? adding more and increasing it, making it bigger, he curtails it by the choices. You know, because we are all sinners. If we are not sinners, there will be no need for that prescription to begin with. It presumes that, that the citizens are sinners. The, the principal issue that I, I want us to have that I think we should focus on is what really is the greatest, in quote unquote, sin that we face. The greatest sin, I'm, I'm using it not from the moral standpoint, not from the practical reality of our nation. The greatest sin that we face in this nation is to reduce poverty. We need somebody who can make money and use money for our development. Because when you are in, I, I think it was in the Russian, in Russian, um, uh, can you say they call it, that he said that a hungry mouth does not understand the language of persuasion. When a man is denied, he's hungry. Sin means nothing. Morality means Morality. absolutely you know, nothing. That's Israel me. Knesset. That would be Israel. Is yeah, it, but oh, you know, no, I'm, I'm sorry, not uh, Russian uh, parliament. Oh, right. It's not can you say, can you say it is Israel. Right. Okay. Russian yeah. parliament. And they said the hungry man does not understand the language of uh, persuasion. And then Even the Bible says, do not make me so poor that I will curse you. Can you imagine the effect of poverty mm. or so rich mm. that well, I will forget you? You know, Dr. Abayomi, there are those who would also wonder, isn't that same poverty that which has been weaponized against the people? But don't answer that one yet. My colleagues in Abuja have a question. Go ahead, Chamberlain. Well, Dr. Bayami, uh, let's bring it back to uh, lots of people just wondering where all of this is headed with the Cynthia and Saints. But in context of our present reality, now uh, the candidates, if you want to look at the leading candidates and several other candidates, and given how certain persons have taken their positions, electorate. For instance, if you look at the position of former President Obasanjo and a lot of other young people who have gone ahead and endorsed their candidates. So in that context, would you say that uh, they are performing their role and rightly so, uh, that that fits into your description of who we need to do what you say to lead this country aright? Well, you are talking about the endorsement, whether they are performing their role, if I understand you, Chamberlain, is that what you're saying? Whether it counts for something, because you, you thought... I mean, you had a position on that matter some time ago. Well, I, it counts for little, for something, but the, the smallest is next to nothing, you know, because the reality of the matter is that uh, uh, we all have our influence, our constituency of influence, you know, so uh, I do not know. It may be exciting, in my view, for the candidates 
But for the voters and the electors, in my view, it counts very little. You know, that's my view. Because um, President Obasanjo is a former president, but he has only one vote. As the least Nigerian citizen in my, ville, in my town, Okeagbe. So, yes, you may have your own uh, excitement in terms of, um, uh, you know, supporting a particular candidate, but I don't think it counts very much in my view. Well, speaking about it counting for much or not from the perspective of the electorate, I mean, we've seen uh, some skeleton in the cupboard, if you will, for the APC and the PDP, accusing themselves of one thing or the other, wanting security agencies to investigate. So on the part of the electorate, do, do you think that all of these allegations makes it a lot more murky and perhaps clearer to other people why they shouldn't choose any of these two and look the way of somebody else who, quote unquote, may be a breath of fresh air in the I think, speaking. I think our people should consider all that irrelevant to the issues that confront the nation. It's an excitement, it's interesting. What? It gingers a fascination about politicians and issues. But the principal issue should be the preoccupation with Nigeria. What should Nigeria be? Now, Look, it was um, uh, 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 Machiavelli who said he wants to talk about how things are, not how they should be. But with our situation, we should be talking about how Nigeria should be, not how Nigeria is. We know how Nigeria is. We should be talking about how it should be. So if we want to talk about how Nigeria should be, Nigeria will be what we want it to be or how it should be when we do something about poverty. That is the foundation of the tragedy of this nation. So we should be looking for a man who can raise the wealth of this nation and use that wealth to develop us. It doesn't matter if this man is said to have made his own wealth in a very crooked manner. Because um, I know you've talked about saints, but here we're talking, uh, and sinners, here we're talking about the law. Uh, you're a lawyer, and you understand how the law works. Uh, these are codes by which a country abides by. Now, if what we're talking about, and we're saying that what we desire is how our country should be, should we bring in people who have gone against the codes of the country, at the laws of the country, and think that they can help us uphold the law when they get into office? Well, we have already brought them up. We have candidates. They've gone through the processes, legal processes, uh, societal processes, party processes, democratic processes, and they have emerged. What is left now is to look into the future. What's the future? Whosoever is elected is subject to certain controls, legal controls, that is inputted in, in the Constitution. Apparently, this is not enough for your party. Uh, uh, Professor Abayami, mean, this is not enough for your party because you say that what we have now are candidates. It was your party who started this issue of SPVs against former Vice President Atiku Abubakar and threatening the security agencies that if they refuse to prosecute, they are going to court. In fact, as we speak, we understand that the spokesperson, uh, one of the spokespersons for your party, is suing... Uh, the, what, the security agencies to ensure that they take uh, former Vice President Atiku Abubakar to court. So if you say that we should look beyond that, but your party is the one now looking into closets and saying, you know, this, this uh, candidate or one or two of these candidates have defects, can we really say that, you know, we've really moved past looking at the candidates for who they are? Well, my point is that I'm not now focusing on a part, my party. I mean, my party is politics, but the issue for us, people, that should be the preoccupation. I mean, naturally, in the, in the context of politicking, all sorts of things will arise 
from the leadership of the party who accuse the other one, the one who accuse the other one, they keep abusing one another. It takes place in all the politics of the world, anywhere. All sorts of things arise, all sorts of accusation, fascinating and exciting. It makes politics interesting as far as I'm concerned. But the issue that should preoccupy us, serious-minded Nigerians, is why are we where we are now? What do we want Nigeria to be? Like I said, we should be thinking of what, how Nigeria should be. We know what it is now. And then ask our questions in deciding who to vote for. Who can generate for this nation the required wealth to reduce poverty and improve us to develop? Because you need the wealth of a nation to develop a nation. The, the nations we respect are the wealthy nations. The rich nations that are in problem are poor nations. So that is the difference. So the mere fact that a political party is accusing the other one, so that should not be of any consequence. As far as I'm concerned, I don't even pay attention to that at all. D D Dr. Bayo, I mean, let me come in. I, I do know that, I mean, we've seen politics play out in many other countries. For instance, uh, when President um, Obama was running, uh, one of the accusations against him then was that he wasn't even American, that yes. uh, where he was born, um, you know, Hawaii, did mm -hmm. not qualify to be a part of the United States. Yes. Those kinds of things, but people might argue. I mean, their politics, uh, because people want to play on people's emotional um, emotions. But mm -hmm. this allegations that we're looking at in Nigeria border on the criminal, border on the very foundation of, you know, a, a new country that we say we want to build or the type of country that we say we want to have. Can the electorate really close its eyes to the allegations that are fl f flying right, middle, left and center but, but, between the APC and the PDP? But these allegations have been on for years. These men have gone through legal process for years. Issues have arisen. Investigations have been conducted in many cases, and so on and so forth. And we are preoccupied, as I said, what I call dead issues. I call it metalegal issues with regard to the electability of appropriate person for the Nigeria of our dream. This is the point I'm making. I'm saying that we are focusing too much on what I would call Issues that are not essential for the present preoccupation we have, which is to elect a president. And what type of president do we want to elect? I'm saying the president we should focus on, not a holy president, but a president, even if he's a sinner, that can transform this nation. Maybe I will say to holiness. But, but, and there's but, but, nothing so, impossible about Dr. that. Bami, if, are you suggesting, or because people have the impression, it comes across to some people, that you're saying uh, the candidate of the ABC is unholy, but he, ha he can deliver Nigeria to what? Where we ought to be? He's unholy, the candidate of MPDP is unholy. Is the candidate of Labour holy? If you look at all of them, it's like I was telling your colleagues. President Obama John once told me that when he wanted to uh, appoint uh, the group managing director of NNPC, he looked at the record of all possible candidates. They were all corrupt. And, but he has still had to appoint one of them. So he called the one he was... What? Well, yes. He looked at all of them. They were all that's corrupt. That's a different scenario. Appointing a candidate and electing a candidate, uh, you know, I know you know that, but well, for instance now, when you say they've gone through the mail, they've gone through several investigations, uh, perhaps you could remind us, has there been any investigation for the APC candidates over, because some of these things flying, where they say between January 2015 to uh, January 28, 2015, that his union bank domiciliary account received cash payment in dollars totaling about four, four million dollars from various SPVs. Has there been any investigation of this kind of matter? That's just a, yeah, an if allegation. You them at all. That's an allegation. <laughs> you understand what I mean? Before a man is. Yeah, but sh should this kind of thing be investigated? 
Anybody can investigate, journalists can investigate it and so on and so on. But the point I'm making is that he is a candidate and the presumption is that becoming a candidate is deserving and he's met legal conditions and constitutional prescriptions. So if you now go and spend all your time at this late hour talking about that, to my mind, it's a bloody waste of time. What would you focus on now? If there are issues, when, he gets, when anybody gets into the office, the National Assembly is there to deal with the issue. So, but what I'm saying is that to preoccupy ourselves with all those metalegal factors now, it's on seriousness with due respect. It appears as though you're saying that, let's just get this done. And then if they have issues, I mean, yes. if indeed they were corrupt, and then we can sort that later. Yes. And I, I'm wondering, because you, you had started when we talked about, you know, those brickbats saying that, well, people can say anything. You don't try to prevent it. It would balance itself out. So it appears as though you're saying, yes, Nigerians acknowledge indeed that these people have, you know, dodgy, um, you know, issues around them. But still they should knowingly elect them. Don't you think that's fully doing what is wrong, even though you have the knowledge that it is wrong? What's the option? That's the issue. Every single... Well, there are 18 options. Yes, that's what I'm saying. And I was given the example of President Obasanjo. He looked at all of them. They are all sinners, corrupt. He told me this personally. And so he picked, he looked at, oh, he said, okay, this one is better than this. This is and then he called him, and he said, you are, you, are, you are a thief. And that one said, no, I'm not a thief. He said, you are corrupt. He said, I'm not. He said, shut up. I looked at your record. You are a thief, but you are a better thief than the other one. So what I'm in essence saying is, we look at all of them, we say, look, what is it that we need from these sinners? Who is of the sinners can give us the best possibility, having regard to the issue that confronts this nation today. Doctor, so let's look at at least maybe the magnanimity or otherwise of these sins you mentioned. The PDP just recently spoke about your candidate and mm -hmm. talked about you know, how his salary was $2,400 and just a few years after he had amassed $661,000 according to court documents, a certain account plus over $1 million and then he had to forfeit $460,000 uh, to the nonsense. United States. I, I mean, those, those are records that are there, yes. $460,000 to the United States government and the spokesperson of his campaign had said mm -hmm. that they were taxed tax I was meant to pay that I didn't pay yes. and then the banks deducted yeah. them they had read questions about yeah. is that tax evasion yeah. or otherwise but to the source which a lot of people have asked his history his source how did someone who was earning two thousand four hundred dollars some few years after amassed that much money he has said in one interview that he was bonus in yeah. another interview he said that he inherited real estate do those questions as a party man, do they bug you? Have you tried to find out that really, is it real estate? Is it bonus? Does it make sense? No, they you? don't really. You see, the point is that we are always looking for the negative, which is okay for anybody that stands up for public office. But let me give you a simple, I trained in America as a lawyer. All the issues they're talking about, for Fisher, it's a very simple process. It's of no consequence at all. If you are involved in drug in America, there is simply no way you won't be prosecuted. I can tell you that categorically. The other thing is that forfeiture is a, a civil process, not a criminal process. Forfeiture. You are not, it is a process against property, not against a person. In the case of a criminal process, it will be a case against a person. And it will not go against his property until he's convicted. Let us understand that. So if the process is just against forfeiture, that's not a criminal process. So are you convinced, which is the other leg of the question, on his source of wealth? Because at some point he had said bonuses from uh, the work he was doing, and, and they had said that you were earning $2,400. How come you have the millions in your account? Just recently he said that he inherited real estate, and there were questions about who did you inherit this from? Because in some documents or in some reports from the State Assembly when he was speaking, he had said that, well, I'm from a poor background. In fact, I had to drop out. Those were the documents no, quoted. So are you clear no, on his source of wealth and are way, you convinced? No, That's the, the question. No, the way we should look at issues is not to ask me 
to explain my source of wealth. No, since you're a party person no. and you're supporting I'm, 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 I'm asking, you. I'm okay. answering your question. You know, in Yoruba, they said it's a little bit. Now, Which means for a non-Yoruba yes, speaking audience. Well, for a non-Yoruba, there, there is a lot of dirtiness in the foundation of wealth. All wealth of any kind. But what you should be preoccupied with is if you know that the source of my wealth is, is illegal, that is your responsibility to find a way to deal with it. With it. You know? If we were to ask all wealthy men in the world how they make their wealth, you will find a lot of revelations. Doctor, you didn't answer my question. The question is, are you yourself convinced um, that, that, that the source of his wealth is explainable of course, and it is clean? I am very, very convinced. How did you get convinced? Well, I'm very convinced for the simple reason. Look at it from a practical standpoint. A man who is a director, who grows to the point of director of mobile producing is it stupid and we'll be running after simple issues hmm. well the, that... se the second thing is that do you think that those organizations are so incompetent that they won't know how have, have information and know about their staff well i guess you know? the, at the end of the day the decision is for nigerians to decide whether which of as you said sinners yes. that they would appoint or mm -hmm. elect into office or give yes. the job of steering the affairs of their lives for yes. the next four years. As Sir uh, Cardi said, there are 18 sinners. Options. I didn't say sinners. Candidates. <laughs> we need to declare on that. Candidates. So, so. Uh, Dr. Jabai, we have to thank you very much for being <laughs> here you. this morning. Human rights activist and pro chancellor, uh, chairman, governing council at the Kunle Ajasin University in Ondo State. Thank you again. For thank you for inviting me. There's more after this break. Please stay with us.